Bene, buongiorno. buongiorno a tutti, grazie di essere qui e per questo everybody. dibattito and che si annuncia molto interessante perché parliamo del tema cruciale del festival, cioè le disuguaglianze e ne parliamo a partire dal libro che è importante che è uscito in questi anni, cioè il capitolo del XXI secolo di Thomas Piketty che avete potuto ascoltare in Trento e poi magari avete sicuramente heard in the last few days here in Trento and whom you You have for sure heard of, even though you may not have read all his book or you may not have followed the ensuing debate amongst economists at international level. So following debate on austerity, this is the most amazing debate because an economic debate becomes a global debate, um, not only amongst experts, so to say, but also as a mainstream topic. So before explaining to you what we're going to talk about today, let me summarize what has happened before today. Well, we have to start back in 2013, a very important year for two reasons. Number one, because the books by Thomas Piketty was published in France and triggered off the debate, not the global debate we're seeing today, that was only a French debate. The community of economists tends to read only English publications, so at the beginning they didn't realize about this important book. But 2013 is also the year of another interesting cultural and economic debate, which is the one revolving around the Reiner Rogoff case. Many of you probably remember this. The debate on austerity is predominantly based on Carmen Reiner's and Frodo's studies who have claimed with their apparently solid evidence that when public debt is more than 90% of the GDP triggers off an avalanche effect, a snowballing effect, so that interest rates on public debt eats up resources, bringing the country out of control. This study, which has become a very successful book named This Time It's Different is the dogma of austerity and is often mentioned as evidence by policymaker, such as Holy Ren at that time, the European Commissioner. Well, apparently, this has nothing to do with what we're debating here today, but actually it has something relevant to it, because at one point, a student writing his PhD about Reiner and Rogoff realized that they have made mistakes in the use of Excel. Some silly mistakes have been made when writing the function of Excel with the loss of many, loss of many data, so that Ryan and Rogoff's conclusions were actually much weaker than people had originally believed. This was a scandal because all those who complained about austerity effects finally could prove that it was all wrong and based on a mistake, an Excel mistake. In 2015, Thomas Piketty's book was published in English, triggering off the international debate. The Financial Times, at the end of May 2014, first wrote, Chris Chai's economics editor, tried to make the same Reiner Rog of operation contesting Piketty and the way how Piketty had used some data about wealth, especially in the UK. The book by Piketty is a very empirical book. It is not a book of economic theory only, but it is based on a huge mass of data. And economists, even those who do not agree with his conclusions, recognize to him the merit of having done an amazing analysis of data on wealth, which are very difficult to find, because as you can all very well understand, it is difficult to estimate the value of a house in the 18th century to compare that value with today's value. So that was the first time that Piketty was at the center of the international debate, and people tried to understand whether his conclusions were grounded or not. Piketty's book supports a very strong idea, that is, that capital yield grows more than economy itself. In other words, there is a cumulative effect that is not incidental, that is not a distortion of the last few years, but is intrinsic in the dynamics of capitalism. That is, wealth is accumulated very, very quickly. 
the rich become richer. We're not talking about income, we're talking about wealth and assets and everything. So R, that stands for yield when it is greater than G, which is a growth of real economy. The illusion we have had in the years after the war, all the way up to the 70s, was an illusion. That is, we thought that equality was increasing with the poorest becoming richer, improving their standard of life. But this was due to the fact that the world war had actually leveled the play field. And this snowball effect had started from a lower level. But capitalism unavoidably leads to explo the explosion of disequality. So Piketty claims it is necessary to think about taxation. But this is not what we're going to focus on right now, because today we're going to focus on the economic issues. Mr. Piketty evokes Marx's capital, but does not agree with the decreasing yield of capital, which according to Piketty is actually growing and not decreasing. So the Rainer Rogers mechanism was applied to the Piketty book, but uh, this was a failure because the economists and others recognize that Piketty's research work is solid and grounded. However, one of the fundamental aspects uh, has been questioned by Etienne Vosmer sitting here next to me, economist, co-director of labor economics, founder of Science Po, app that is a research center, but he will explain better to us what he actually does. But the important point is that, together with other economists, in a study he has criticized radically Piketty's book because he claims that Piketty made a mistake in calculating a fundamental aspect of wealth accumulation that refers to housing and the value of houses. We all know very well that a lot of wealth is immobilized and frozen in buildings, in houses. So if you make a mistake in estimating this part of wealth, everything goes wrong. Mr. Etienne Vesmer's confrontation is parallel to the Financial time, Times, but it happens within the French debates. It actually came before the Financial Times comments, and it has taken some time for it to become mainstream. Matthew McMahon, a few months ago in March, however, has criticized Piketty's book with a different perspective, but following the same line and focusing on uh, real estate wealth and this accumulation of wealth. This was done in America, and it has a big international eco. However, Etienne Vesmer's analysis is much more disruptive, so to say, because it refers not only to the use of data, but also to a conceptual debatable approach that Piketty has used. And it will be interesting to see what is left of Piketty's lesson if we take this detail away from it. But let's see if Mr. Etienne Vesmer is able to persuade us, and then we shall have our Q&A discussion with the public to understand what is left of Piketty's study. Mr. Vesmer, you have the floor. I don't speak Italian, so I'm going to speak uh, either French or English. I guess English is the easiest. And uh, indeed, thanks for this very nice introduction. I followed some of the details. I uh, teach in Sciences Po, which is uh, one of uh, those uh, French uh, grandes écoles. So uh, I teach the first year undergrad microeconomics. Uh, to the future ministers and civil servants. So if at some point France does well, uh, I will be uh, praised for that. But if uh, France fails to develop in the next 20 years, it will be my fault. And I'm a, a labor economist and a urban economist uh, who has um, thought a little bit about housing prices, uh, mobility, and access to jobs. Uh, and um, I was actually quite fascinated by this uh, story of uh, rising wealth inequality that is put forward by Thomas Piketty. And what I'm going to talk about today is 
this interplay between housing and the secular rise in inequality and mostly about wealth inequality, okay, what people own and the way uh, they save their income and how this accumulates in their hands. And this is where uh, housing, which is one of the most important assets of people, uh, will play a, a key role. So it's always uh, very impressive to see the uh, participation to these debates about inequality. Uh, of course, when Thomas goes somewhere, uh, the rooms are full. But even when he's not here, the, the, the rooms are full. And there is indeed a great concern about uh, this idea of uh, rising inequality. I think most of us are interested in this issue because we ask ourselves whether this rise of inequality, which which is uh, something that nobody can deny, uh, if this rise in inequality is something which is out of control, okay? Is it something that uh, policymakers need to really take care of? Is it something that we can stop? Is it something that is going to uh, make the society disappear or dissolve into uh, civil conflicts? Or is it something that is more or less under control, but for which some specific actions are needed? And the most uh, fascinating view of inequality is the one uh, concerning wealth inequality. So again, wealth being uh, what people have accumulated, or houses, or cars, uh, or paintings, for those who have paintings. And, uh, I think the book of Thomas is very nice about showing a couple of facts about that wealth inequality. So just, and I, I'm sure I will be a little bit too technical by defining the concept, but the, the key of understanding is there. He defines a, a measure of wealth, which is the sum of a couple of components of wealth. One is... Uh, capital of companies like machines, uh, office space, uh, all things that can produce uh, something, can produce returns, plus land, so agricultural land mostly, which is uh, one of the sources of wealth, and uh, the last component is housing. And he looked at the evolution of this wealth over time, over the centuries, and uh, compare it to what people can actually produce with this uh, wealth, with this capital, that's something that we call GDP or national income. And it shows that there has been a very fast increase in this ratio of uh, capital over uh, income over the last decades. And at a, up to a point where we would reach a level of uh, this ratio K over Y that would be as high in the 21st century as it was uh, in the beginning of the 20th century. So the broad view of inequality is the following. The world has different periods of al uh, alternating. We have sometimes periods of increasing inequality, sometimes periods of compression of inequality. And we would be in a phase of rising inequality where, as put by uh, the author himself, divergence forces, and uh, that the, the word divergence is very important here, might dominate, as it seems to be the case in the beginning of uh, our century. Okay? And we, we may return to the level of inequality of the, the 19th century or the beginning of the 20th century. And what is behind is a story of uh, mechanism which is out of control, like a nuclear reactions that nobody controls. The idea would be that wealth has accumulated a little bit too fast, <clears throat> and people who own that wealth are becoming richer and richer. They just sit on a pile of money, and that money produces returns. That's what is called ER here on this, uh, on this screen. So ER is the return on capital. Each year in the bank, I can get two, three, four, five percent. And if that returns is above the growth uh, of uh, the gross rate of production, then there is this tendency towards uh, indefinite accumulation of wealth in the hands of the few who are the richest. Okay, that's like a snowball effect. You know, when you have a ball of snow and then it, it falls down uh, the mountains, then it becomes bigger and bigger, and the richest uh, become, uh, in the end, the owner of the world economy. 
So of course, that's a scary story of the world, and it's in a way capturing some of the facts. And the facts uh, are represented here. So this graph is probably the most famous of uh, the book of Thomas Piketty. So you have <coughs> the ratio of uh, capital over income, national income, over uh, no less than four centuries, from 1700 to 2010. Uh, of course, the scale uh, is not constant over time, so because we don't have the data for everything, but this is the main chart. And as you can see, uh, this ratio k over y, so what people have saved and accumulated divided by, by what they can produce in a year, this ratio has gone from 700 persons, so uh, a relatively large number, to a very small number, uh, historically speaking, 300 in the 1920s, so the First World War and the Great Depression in the 20s destroyed wealth and destroyed the stock of capital. And then we would be in a phase of rising inequality, and as you see, in the course of the second half of the, the 20th century, we have this uh, reaccumulation of wealth and capital. Now, these are the three components of this wealth. The, the black one is land, agricultural land, and that part has vanished over time. Uh, indeed, because we don't, do not produce only with agricultural land. There has been the industrial revolution behind, and so we produce thanks to other forms of capital. The second form of capital is this uh, top area here, so that part here, which is other forms of capital. Basically, this is equipment, machinery tools, machine tools, so basically companies, firms producing uh, goods. And then this last component of wealth, is this light gray area, which is housing. Okay, so these are the three components of wealth that people own, you, me, uh, our families, uh, own the economy. Uh, some are rich, some are less rich, but overall, this is the sum of these three components. This is for France, but the picture is similar in Canada, the UK, and some countries. Not all countries, but pretty, pretty much it is what inspired uh, Thomas Piketty. Now, of course, if you look at the recent trend over the last four de decades, uh, since the 70s, most of the increase here would come from the increase in housing. And behind this increase in housing, you have the increase in the price of housing. In some countries, and especially France, uh, housing prices have gone up very fast, multiplied by two or three. And so uh, a given square meter in Paris uh, has become extremely expensive as compared to 40 years ago. Okay. Now, if you look at this curve, what you see is indeed a U-curve. It went up from very high level to a low level, and then it increased again. If you exclude housing, and I'm going to tell you why we should or not exclude housing, then you don't have a U-curve, but you have instead an L-curve. And the L-curve says what it says, which is that it was high, it has dropped, and now it's stable at some low level. Okay? So... We should think about whether we should include housing in the measure of wealth. And if we include housing, should we interpret this housing as something generated returns and uh, producing more inequality as time goes? And on that second question, I will try to answer that the answer is no. Housing is a very specific uh, asset. So should we include housing or not in the measurement of wealth? Of course, if you own your house, you are richer than if you don't. So indeed, housing is a part of wealth of people. But it's a specific asset in the sense that it's an asset that people tend to live in. Okay? Uh, if you have your house, if you have an apartment and you live in, inside it, it's not that it's something that is going to produce some real return. Okay, you are living in a place, you are not receiving a check every month. Instead, you are saving the money that you have to spend if you live in a rental, in an apartment that you rent. So, housing is not going to produce the returns that's going to increase the accumulation of wealth. It's going to help people to save some rental price, the rents that they would pay otherwise. So, that's very important because the key issue here is going to be the interpretation we are going to make about this uh, source of wealth. And as you may know, if you have uh, studied the history of economics, uh, the measurement of capital has always been a, a very 
uh, strong controversy. And it has been the issue of controversy between what is called the two Cambridges. You had the Cambridge in Massachusetts, uh, where the neoclassical economist that used to measure uh, capital like Thomas Piketty in terms of uh, the price of capital, the current price. Um, and you had the heterodox uh, people in Cambridge, UK, that would instead consider that capital is actually the sum of hours spent to produce it. And so it's not to be evaluated at the price, but more uh, as the effort made in the past to accumulate it. So these are different views of capital. And the interpretation that we are going to make about this U-curve is going to depend on the type of measurement we are going to, uh, to impose on this uh, issue of capital. So indeed, and that's the key of the argument, there are two ways of measuring housing capital. One, as I said, is what Thomas used, which comes from national accounts where you evaluate the unit of housing at the price that is where it, at, at which it is sold at any time. So that's called the current price, the current market price. But that is a value which is the value that you could get out of your wealth if you decided to sell it. There is another view of capital which is uh, evaluated at the price of the dividends of this capital, which is the rental price of housing. So if you decided to rent your unit of housing, you would get uh, a market price, but that would be a rent, and that rent uh, would indeed contribute to your uh, rising uh, wealth in the sense that is what is going to produce uh, more money and, uh, and wealth accumulation. And the nice thing about economic theory is that, in principle, these very two different measures, right, the spirit is completely different. One is measuring capital at a price of transactions. The second one is measuring capital at the price of the rental market. They should give exactly the same outcome, the same result. We should get the same number exactly. Because behind there is an equilibrium in the housing market. People should be indifferent between buying or renting. And this equilibrium should produce the same value for the rental price of capital or the uh, actual price of capital. But this is not what we observe. That's one of the uh, trends that we have observed in the last few decades in France, for instance. Housing prices have gone up a lot and rents have remained fairly stable. That might be counterintuitive because we have decided that in big cities, rents are increasing and increasing, but actually, if anything, prices have increased much faster and rents have been relatively under control. I will show you some data on that. And so, since the two series, price and rents, do not evaluate, do not evolve at the same pace, then the choice of measurement matters. And then the interpretation one can make out of it will be uh, very different because the choice of the measurement for housing capital will have an implication on whether this curve is a U curve or L curve. And so the view about inequality will be changed. And more importantly even, this has very concrete implications on the type of taxation you want to impose on wealth and on capital. And again, this is of course the key uh, implication of any analysis of inequality. You don't study inequality for, because you like it, you study inequality because you want to know how to tax uh, efficiently an economy to reduce inequality. So let me show you this graph which is for France, but you would find the same in the Netherlands, you would find the same uh, in Spain, the same in the UK. The blue curve is a curve since the mid-80s in France of the rental price of housing, that is the rents that people pay, relative to the uh, disposable income of households. Okay? And if you look at this curve, it's not that it does not increase, it increases a little bit, but it does not increase dramatically. It's uh, more or less uh, a flat curve. The red one instead is very different. The red one is housing price per square meter, controlling for quality, quality of housing has increased over time, so we try to control for quality. If you look at this curve, since the mid-90s, late 90s, what you see is a doubling of housing prices relative to income. Okay, so price and rents are not the same things, and so the measurement issue will, will become important here. So that suggests two viewpoints which are going to be different in terms of 
methodology of measurement of inequality, but also in terms of the interpretation. If you evaluate this ratio k over y, remember it's accumulated wealth divided by what people can produce out of it, you have a great measure of wealth. And if you just accept that it's only wealth, the value of uh, capital in firms, the value of capital for households, how much you can value the cars, how much you can value the apartments, then wealth has increased relative to income, and there is no question about that. And Thomas is right. Uh, there has been this new curve, and wealth has gone up in the last decade. Now, if you want to interpret this K over Y as something producing inequality alone, that is producing returns on wealth, then you have to evaluate it using the dividends of capital, that is uh, using the fact that housing units produce a return which are only the rents that people get out of it. And if you do that, you might potentially interpret this K over Y corrected for rents as a source of potential explosive dynamics, but it happens that K over Y measured this way is not increasing, it's actually flat. And not only it's flat, but it's at, it at some historical uh, minimum. Let me be more precise about that. This is something that we did uh, one year ago, or more or less. We were probably the first to think deeply about capital and housing uh, in Thomas Piketty's book. We did the following exercise, a very simple one. We use the series of Thomas Piketty for many countries, and we divide housing by its price. So we sort of normalize for the price increase that we observe, and we multiply it by the rents that people would receive if they decided to rent uh, housing capital. And that gives us a measure of wealth that is connected to the actual dividends, the actual uh, returns that people can make out of this capital. So it's the perfect measure to know whether there is growing inequality by a self-reinforcing mechanism or not. So this is a paper by uh, Audran Bonnet, Pierre-Henri Bonneau, and Guillaume Chapelle and myself. Two of them are uh, PhD st students in my own institution. The third one is a researcher in one of our centers. And when you do so, it turns out that capital over national income is actually flat, and flat uh, since 1950 in most countries. There is only one country for which <coughs> this has still increased, which is Germany. But Germany is a specific country. And actually, uh, in Thomas Piketty's book, uh, Before Corrections, this is the only country for which capital over income uh, had declined in its story. So actually, what we show is that for Germany, the story is a little bit different for demographic reasons, mostly. So uh, this is... Sorry, I think that since it's a very important point, if you could explain again how... This is the chart yeah, that is going to explain. because it's a very turning point here. This is exactly the earth of the argument. So there are a couple of lines here. And if you want to look at the curve, which is this solid line here, so this uh, black solid line, which goes basically from 300% to 600%, this curve is Thomas Piketty's uh, capital over uh, income ratio. So this is the thing that since the 50s has been multiplied by two uh, due to uh, mostly housing. Okay, so this is the original graph of Piketty, but at a scale which is only the, the last 50, 60 years. So, and you see this doubling <coughs> of capital over uh, income ratio, which is uh, the source of concern. Do we, uh, are we facing this uh, explosive inequality process? So what we did is reinterpret uh, K over Y as capital producing dividend, that is doing our transformation. We actually try to compute the, uh, the dividends from this uh, capital stock, this housing stock. And this is uh, the curve, which is uh, the dashed line here. So this is the sum of all forms of capital in France. And if you look at the initial part of this curve, it's 500%. If you look at the final, this is 500%. Okay, so what this says is that our correction shows that capital over income expressed in terms of the dividends capital can actually produce has remained stable over time over the last 60 years. Okay? Precisely because as the price of housing goes up, the return on housing goes down. 
Okay, if you buy an apartment which is much more expensive and that the rent that you can get out of it remains stable, it just means that the return on capital is going down. So over that period in France, you saw two phenomena at the same time, a rise in prices of housing, flat rents, and a decline in the return on that specific form of capital, which is housing. Okay? So it's not an explosion of returns on capital, it's exactly the opposite, it's a decline in the return on housing and the decline of capital. So let me reach three intermediate conclusions and then we go on the discussion in the implication of these uh, conclusions. So first, again, there should be no concern about capital over income ratio measured in the way uh, of the, the book of Thomas Piketty if we just interpret it as wealth, okay? because wealth is the sum of all components. Suppose that some of you are rich enough to get paintings at home. You have a private collection of Monet, Picasso, uh, Da Vinci uh, paintings. This is part of our wealth, of course. But if it's a private collection, it doesn't produce any return. It's just that we have it in our, in our uh, apartments. That wealth may be fragile. It may fluctuate over time. It might go up, down, depending on the price. It can even vanish but it has to be counted as part of the wealth. In that sense, uh, that measure is correct. What is not correct, I think, and I don't mean that Thomas pushed that line too much, but many readers of Thomas Piketty uh, got that from the book. They thought there is a, a sort of accumulation of capital. And this K over Y that is increasing is a source of exploding inequality because that wealth is concentrated in the hands of the richest. So there should be some kind of fatal process leading inexorably to uh, diverging wealth. And that's the part that I think is, can be challenged very easily because, again, that wealth is not producing returns. Think about it. Suppose that you're super rich and that you have a very nice boat uh, and that you can, can go in the Adriatic every summer or every week. It's not producing any returns. If anything, you have to pay a lot for the repairs, you have to pay for the captain, etc. So if anything, it's good to make you poorer, not richer. So of course, it's nice to have a, a big yacht and, 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 and sail or whatever, but it's not a process of accumulation of wealth. Actually, it's a <laughs> process of dissipation of wealth. And the same for housing. If you own a castle in the Dolomites, the price of it might have gone up a lot. Fine with you, you can sell it at any time. But if you want to keep it, it's going to uh, help you dissipate your, your money because you need to repair and, and, and make uh, the value of it constant. And that can be pretty expensive. So the third temporary conclusion here, as a matter of fact, if you look carefully at uh, other components of inequality, which is what you see here, for instance, this is what is called the inequality of wealth in France. This is the top 10% of wealth relative to uh, total wealth or the top 1% of wealth relative to others. That comes from Thomas Piketty's book as well. What you see is that despite this K over Y going up a lot, if anything, the inequality of wealth has gone down since the 1910, 1930s has gone down. So despite the huge rise in housing, inequality of wealth has not gone down. It has gone, it's not gone up, it has gone down. Okay. So, it's time to ask, is it a pure academical, ac academic debate between two economists, or between, between 20 economists, uh, something we should not care about? I think the answer is no, it's much deeper than that, because all the implication of the analysis uh, concern inequality and concern taxation. And so if you believe that K over Y is exploding because of this self-perpetuating mechanism of wealth accumulation, then comes naturally the idea of taxing wealth. And that's where comes the idea of this world taxation of wealth uh, that comes in the end of the book of Thomas Piketty. Now, if it's only a, so a question of wealth, but not a question of accumulation of wealth, then it's a little bit more subtle because it's not that you want to tax wealth per se. You can just tax uh, inheritance can just tax people when they die and so that they don't transmit this wealth to their, to their kids, to their, uh, to their, uh, to their kids and, and daughters and sons. You want to tax only at the time where people uh, are inheriting. So 
That's the question I'm going to ask now. I'm going to say, what are the implications of this analysis in terms of, house, of, uh, of taxation? In particular, what's the best way to tax housing? In, in country like France, taxation of housing is obviously a very sensitive issue because uh, people have become richer virtually because <coughs> their apartments are much more expensive, they can be sold. So should we tax that even though they don't get any return on that or should we postpone a little bit until they die or until they sell to make a, a capital gain? And that's a very uh, important question and not an easy one to answer. So what's the relevant taxation on the housing market? There are a couple of things that we can tax. First, should we tax the owner-occupiers? So some of us are owning an apartment or a house? The answer is yes. Most countries have a property tax, and this property tax is always a proportion of, of the value of that house, which is fine. But what happens if the price of housing is multiplied by three, which is what happened in France since the mid-90s? Should we multiply the taxes by three themselves? And the answer is no, I think. If we are logical, we should think of taxing the value of properties and make it evolve a little bit more slowly, uh, following the evolution of rents. And again, that's a little bit uh, subtle, but the idea is that by being owner of my house, I save rent as compared to the poor young guy that have to rent their uh, apartment, their, their dwelling. And the inequality between the owner and the renter is just the value of the rent. So if anything, the taxation could, should correct for this inequality, but following slowly the evolution of rents, not this uh, hugely fluctuating price of, of capital. Second thing, should we tax other forms of housing capital? Should we tax secondary houses? That's perfectly fine. Secondary houses are not a primary good by definition. So can sell your secondary house if you don't want to pay the taxation, but you don't need to, to live elsewhere because you are, it's a, by definition a secondary house. Should we tax uh, residential investments? Uh, that's something that depends on the situation of the country. In a country like France, we have a shortage of housing in big cities. So if anything, we want to push towards residential investments. So uh, it's not necessarily a good idea to tax the owner of residential investments. Uh, in other countries where you have an excess supply of housing, then it's perfectly fine to tax more uh, residential investment. But you see that the taxation of this capital stock of housing really depends on its nature, whether it's residential investment, whether it's secondary houses, or whether it's home occupiers uh, that have to be taxed. And that's not so easy to understand if you just look at uh, this rough measure of inequality, which is K over Y. And the last, but maybe the most important thing, is should we tax housing capital gains? And again, you will see that this is exactly um, the same question as the one that we had in mind in the beginning, which is what's the interpretation of K over Y? Why? Suppose that you live in your apartment, and that apartment that you bought 100,000 euro in the 80s or 90s is now four times more expensive. So you sell it and you make a capital gain going from 100,000 to 400,000. So you make a huge capital gain. Should we tax this capital gain? Well, again, it depends because if you live in this place and that's your owner occupier of that place, sure, you make a capital gain. But this capital gain is virtual in a way because it's, your, it's the place where you live. So if you sell it, you have to lay, live elsewhere. And if you live elsewhere, you have to buy that place, presumably, and you have to buy it at a price that has increased as well. So you have, you have made no capital gain in, in practice. You have made one, but you have to buy immediately after. It, sure. <laughs> and the mystery is why people don't do it. Okay? So they attach some value at this housing capital, but indeed, uh, if they sell it, it's not a capital gain unless they rent. Okay? So, I think we come back to that on the discussion because that's a very important point and you're right to point it out. Now, if you're owner occupier, you need to find another one. If you want to expand your space, then you actually lose. You make a capital loss. Okay? So it's a double penalty in a sense if you tax housing at the market price. And in most countries, at least in mine, since the early 80s, uh, capital gains in the housing market are not taxed if you're a, a resident of your house. Okay? And I think that's the exact same reason why one should not consider K over Y, 
evaluated at market price as a measure of capital. It's because it does not produce dividend beyond the rent that you save. So it's exactly the same question. The reason why we don't tax capital gains for uh, people living in their house is the reason why K over Y is not capital producing dividends, it's only wealth. Okay. That's the, uh, the, the key message. So I've just a couple of points to conclude, and they're only, well, there are six, which is long, but they're very short. First point, capital in the sense of producing dividends has no trend in the last four decades in most countries. Second point, obviously the debate on wealth inequality is welcome. We should think a little bit more about all those things, and this is the key uh, message of Thomas Piketty's book. Uh, inequality has increased. We know that. Nobody denies it. The question is whether it's a process out of control or not, and I tend to believe that this third point, uh, the alarmist conclusion of exploding inequality is not there, and that's simply actually wrong. Uh, because of the uh, discussion that uh, was done before. Rather, I think we should put all our intellectual effort on something else, which is not the accumulation of wealth by rentier, which is not something we see in the data, but why inequality of income has increased. And there are two sources. One is globalization, the second one is technical progress. There has been these big waves of uh, innovations that have favored high income inequality. So if you go in the Silicon Valley, it's impossible to buy anything because people have become rich and richer. You have the Google millionaires, you have these high tech companies, you have lawyers. So people have produced innovations that have a market price. And so that makes income inequality increase a lot. It's not that people are rentier. It's not like, uh, you know, we have Madame Betancourt in France that just inherited or married well, and she's rich, and she's richer and richer. It's not what we see. This is one example, but you have Bill Gates, you have all these other people. Let me be provocative. I think world taxation of capital has no future. It's just a utopia. Uh, what we need is to think about a fiscal system that corrects for high income inequality when that income inequality comes from innovations. We want to tax inequality, but we don't want to prevent people from investing and innovating. And that's a difficult issue. And the last point, uh, why is it that housing prices have increased so much? So let me be uh, uh, pro-Italian, uh, pro-France. It's because it's a beautiful country where everyone wants to live. Take any random walk in any village in France and Italy, compared to a random walk in any small town in the US or in the UK, it's very different. We want to live in France and Italy and pay big prices for this places because the standard of living, the, the quality of food, whatever, social security makes this country very nice. So I'm very optimistic in the end. I don't see an explosion of inequality. I see an, an increase in inequality, but nothing out of control. And the reason why this valuation of capital is so high in our country is something that has to see with the quality of life. And so I'm concluding on that word. And uh, I thank you for your attention. I just want to point out uh, that if uh, you're interested by those debates, I've put some of these elements on my own page. There is a special uh, page for uh, Thomas Piketty's debate, uh, and this is what you can find here. So thank you. Okay, grazie. Grazie a Etienne Vasmer. Just per fine. Thank you very much to Mr. Tien Vesper to make absolutely sure that we've understood each other. Piketty's book was so successful in the debate about inequality because it was focusing on wealth and not on income, on what people, how much people earn when they belong to the top richest ones. And we've just heard from Mr. Etienne Vesmer that this can lead to a distortion because you would view a crucial elements such as houses uh, in the wrong way. The right way to understand about their value is how much they yield. I have a question for Etienne, but first of all, we can collect your questions. So uh, you can ask them in Italian and in English. Italiano, lui sente traduzione. So just feel free to ask your questions in English or in Italian. We shall collect three questions, and then we shall go on with the answers. 
Uh, my question is, uh, maybe there is a way to uh, decide uh, if uh, we, we should look uh, at housing uh, at market price uh, or at the price of dividends. And uh, maybe uh, we uh, would want uh, to know uh, how much uh, of the um, capital of the uh, top 1% uh, is in housing and uh, how much uh, uh, is uh, in stocks, uh, shares, uh, uh, whatever. Uh, because, for example, uh, Italy is a country where 70% uh, of families own uh, their uh, apartments, and so this is a spreading of uh, wealth, but uh, this um, capital of the average Italian family uh, house uh, is probably 95% of their capital, which uh, would be not the case of the top 1%. So I would like you to elaborate uh, on this. Uh, uh, the rest is just uh, one, um, uh, one small question. I would uh, take issue with your example comparing a yacht uh, in, in the Adriatic uh, uh, Sea with um, housing because housing uh, notoriously is a very liquid form of capital. Uh, you have uh, your castle in the Alp, and uh, uh, sooner or later, a Dubai sheikh would like to spend 20 million to have it. Yachts uh, depreciate uh, more quickly. That's it. Uh, you want to, maybe it's better. Couple of no more than three. No more than three. Okay. Mi leggo alla do. I would like to go back to the question about the castle, which has just been asked. I mean, if I own a castle and I live it as it is for 20 years uh, without receiving any rent for it, in 20 years, I've got to be even richer than what I am now, simply in virtue of this fact, uh, I don't think that wealth should be evaluated merely as a flow of dividends. And then, of course, uh, the evaluation is changeable not only for houses, it's virtual, not only for houses, but also for shares, because the shares, uh, for sure, oscillate and everything depends on whether you manage to sell them at which price you manage to sell them. Every type of wealth is virtual because until you realize it, that is, you sell it, uh, it does not become realistic wealth. I didn't understand what you meant by the castle. Well, I meant to say that I could have a castle and I don't perceive any rent, but in 20 years I still have my castle. and. Sooner or later, I will find that super rich sheik willing to pay 20 million euro for my decrepit castle. So we can't say that this is not wealth, merely because there is no flow of dividends. I have the impression that this is not the right way. He doesn't say that it is not wealth. It says it's not an accumulation of wealth because it doesn't produce dividends. But anyway, last question, and then Etienne will answer them. It is estimated that some 100 families were thrown out of their houses uh, in 2014, uh, a month, per month. So 100 families per month thrown out of their houses. Doesn't this sound, in Spain, yes. Yeah, doesn't this sound as increasing and worrying inequality? Uh, mostly thinking that those apartments then go to banks which try to sell them for much more? Uh, not for much more, maybe. <laughs> Ma, yeah. No, uh, tre e rispondiamo, poi facciamo un altro giro, perché sennò ci perdiamo le domande iniziali. Okay, Th thank you very much. I'm going to try to answer the question before I forget them, so because they are very interesting ones and, and deep points. So, I think, um, the issue of whether housing is a good measure of inequality or not is indeed um, an interesting one because 
if anything, and again, the, the figures that you gave for Italy uh, are more or less the same in France. It's a little bit less. Uh, I think 60% of households in France own their house. And uh, that was, this number was much smaller in the 50s. So what happened in the last 40 years is a sort of democratization of access to wealth, thanks to housing, because the credit market developed. People could borrow to buy their house. And so uh, the fact that not only people own more houses, but the price of houses have gone up is a, a source of compression of inequality. Okay, uh, and that's exactly the opposite as what we would believe if we looked at K over Y and believe that it's a source of diverging inequality. It's actually, housing has been a, a powerful factor of compression of inequality. And again, it's because the credit market has worked relatively well uh, over that period. Um, then, um, the question is, whether the very rich people, the top 1%, top 5% of wealth inequality, have their, uh, the majority of their assets into uh, housing, and the answer is no. So given that the relative price of housing has gone up relative to the price of other assets, again, this trend towards higher capital over income ratio, which is the trend from the increase in the price of capital, is another source of compression of relative inequality. And this is why when I showed you this graph, so sorry, This graph here, which is basically the ratio of the wealth in the ends of the top 1%, which is the, the squares, of, or the top 10%, which are the triangles, this share has declined, okay? exactly at the time where the price of housing has gone up. So again, the view that we get out of this is that, if anything, housing has contributed to reducing wealth inequality. That's the first order thing. Then comes the questions, uh, what happens in, in the bottom of the distribution? So some people were expelled. That's the same in France, by the way. In Spain, it's a bit specific because people have borrowed for 40 years. Uh, they have signed this crazy credit contract where not only they have to pay for 40 years, but their, their kids will have also to pay for the, the mortgage, which is somehow insane and that's uh, where uh, capitalism has become mad because one should have prevented that from happening but it's not connected to the debate that richer people become richer if anything it's banks that uh, benefited from low interest rates so they had a lot of liquidity they tried to sell those liquidity but in a way nobody was forced to, uh, to to rent it happens that culturally speaking Spanish people wanted to own and at any price and until they realized that it was an economic mistake doing, doing so. But uh, again, I, I, I totally agree, first, that there is rising inequality. Second, that this rising inequality is more in the bottom than in the top. Uh, and again, the issue about the top, this concern about the top 1%, let me be frank, it's pure marketing. It's pure marketing and it's pretty efficient, of course. One of my colleagues said once, uh, if you think about the top 1% or about the top 0.01%, it's a good way to tell to people like us, which are already in the top of the distribution, you should be jealous because there are people above you that <laughs> have become richer. That's the way uh, we attract attention. But this is not exactly the, the, the main picture that I get out of the data. The picture I get out of the data is that uh, Rich people in the last 20 years are in the high tech, in the biotech. They are lawyers, they are people working. They accumulate wealth, but they also spend it. They invest in these big boats. I'm going to come back to the question on the, on, on the, on the, on the castle and the boats. And they dissipate their money somehow. It's not like it's going to explode. There is this inequality process. We accept it. I, I think it's a bad thing overall. But it comes from economic fundamentals that are not uh, the one that are a story of rent accumulation, or perpetual accumulation. I'm not sure um, I can answer all the questions about uh, whether we should indeed value K over Y at the price or at the rent. Uh, I think that if you want to interpret K over Y as producing dividends, the natural way is to use the measure on dividends. Uh, it's a bit tautological what I say, but if you think of dividends, then talk about dividends. Uh, 
if you want to talk about wealth, then let's measure at the price that, at which you can sell it. And, but these are different objects, and the conclusion you can make out of it are different too. So that's, I don't say much more than that. Um, did I answer the question on the boats and the castles? or Not completely, so can, <laughs> can you ask again because... Sorry, we are talking about um, very different kind of, of assets. Uh, uh, housing is uh, very liquid uh, in, uh, if we are not uh, living in a suburb uh, uh, in Detroit. In Paris, Rome, uh, Venice, uh, Trento, Toulouse, uh, uh, housing is very liquid. So that means that uh, uh, if I have uh, an apartment, uh, medium, uh, very small uh, apartment, I do have uh, half a million uh, euros uh, there. And if I have a castle, I do have 10 million uh, here. So uh, while uh, a yacht, uh, you can uh, uh, be an amateur and you can sell uh, it secondhand, but it depreciates, uh, this is not the case for housing. Yeah, I'm not an expert on, on the big castles and private jets, but my understanding is that this is a market which is pretty liquid, actually. So if you, you have your private jet, you can sell it at a lower price. But uh, while housing, I agree, in big cities, it's relatively fast to sell, but it's not the case of most of the housing. It takes a couple of months to sell, especially in the depressing markets. So I would tend to think that... Um, Evaluating that form of capital as the wealth that is immediately available is not as simple as that, because precisely it can take some time, uh, especially in a market which goes uh, poorly. Uh, that makes me think that we had this policy, I guess it's uh, in only for France, but uh, we induce poor families to buy. And uh, France is a vast uh, country in which you have places which are not very economically active. And we subsidize uh, their credits. We say you should buy, and then they buy, and then the region is economically depressed. And not only they are not very rich, but also they have a, a kind of asset which is not that liquid, and they are stuck in the place where there is no job. So I'm sure there are some similarities uh, in Italy, in some regions as well. So uh, again, housing is not the best liquid and the, most, the best investment for, for this reason. It's a good store of value for liquid uh, places, like in the center of the city, but maybe not for uh, medium income, low income families. Okay, so I'm... Rispondo solo una cosa sul castello perché mi è capitato di parlare con una persona che possiede un castello e quindi non capita. Back to the castle example. I know a person who owns a castle and what you told us before does not work out because you don't manage to sell a castle more than once in your life. That is, nobody knows whether a castle is worth 10, 5, 15, 50 million euros. What we know for sure is that to maintain it you have to pay taxes, you have to pay a janitor to, take, to look after it. So it is not technically provable that the value of the castle increases in time or goes down in time because none of us has ever bought a castle and none of us can evaluate its real value. So that's not an effective example in my opinion. We will allow for three more questions and then I shall conclude my, my question. Question: Is the revenue from the rentals somehow considered in the epsilon factor? Because if so, probably it should be not considered at all. So the funny thing is that it is considered in the measurement of the denominator on this Y, the income. So of course the dividend of capital are included as GDP, in part of GDP. Even the, the fictive, the virtual returns on housing. So we have a stock of capital, all the apartments that people uh, own and live in, and the national account estimates the value of the rent, and they add it up in the denominator, which is this Y. Okay. While K, by definition, is, is uh, the, the, how would you say in Italian, pat patrimoine, patrimonio? Patrimonio. Patrimonio. Uh, there is no return. It's just the, the, the price, the, the, the value, and you evaluate the value at the market price. So that actually goes even more in my direction, in the sense that those dividends, uh, they are counted only there and not here. Uh, so may I ask, uh, 
Dov'è? Ah. Ok. Ce n'era no. ne anche una lì, eh? Ok. Vado. Vai. So, may I ask if uh, when you evaluating uh, uh, the present value of dividend, did you take in account in any way the term value of the housing? It's like a similar question, but I think you should take in account the term value of the... the, the sorry, the, the, what? The, the, what? The, the term value. When you're evaluating with the you mean discounted... The, some uh, discount factor? Yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah, in any way, did you take in account it? Yes. So, first, we wanted to do a very simple exercise, which is to keep the discount factor constant. Suppose that it's some psychological value. I discount the future versus, uh, versus the present at a constant rate, not to perturb this uh, simple correction. But then, of course, and we, we send our paper to a journal, and uh, referees ask exactly the same question. Maybe you were a referee, anonymous <laughs> referee. And they ask, but what's the story behind? And so we, what we did is to look at the evolution of the discount factors and one proxy for the discount factor is the rate of interest at which rate people can borrow. And then we understood something which is quite interesting. Over time, uh, in France as in most European countries, thanks to the European Central Bank, uh, the rate at which people can borrow went down. Okay, so, and this is probably a good explanation for, for a good explanation for the rise of housing prices. What happened is that in Europe, people had more liquidity; they could borrow at a lower rate, so the demand for housing went up and prices of housing went up. Now, this is what explains this K over Y going up: the decline in the rate of discount. Think of the interpretation of this ratio in terms of accumulation of wealth. It's according to Thomas the fact that ER, the returns on capital, goes up or is higher than the rate of growth. So you have two conflicting views, and again, you can choose one against the other because they have different implications. On the one hand, if you believe that rents accumulate and people get richer, you, you believe that the rate of discount goes up. But here, what is behind this is a rise in the price of housing that is probably due to the lax policy of European Central Bank over the last 20 years. And so this is, again, a completely different view of the world. <clears throat> uh, relatively uh, expanding monetary policy that pushed price of assets up. And at some point, this will go down. The, when the ECB will decide to raise interest rates, then K over Y will go down again. And that will be the, the this, is, this is, again, an artifact <clears throat> of the price of housing. So at some point, that's a prediction I make. Uh, we are recorded, so some, somebody can tell me we if I'm wrong in it. 10 years. Kevor Y will be gone with the wind because this is due to the price of housing, which goes up and down. Grazie. In Italiano. You say that in France the prices of houses grow. In Italy, if you have a house, you have to sell it now with a 30-40% discount. So that L, as a matter of fact, it's not just flat, but it's declining. So actually, it takes a long term to actually take a snapshot of the situation. But in the present situation, the Italian economy is in a big crisis, and that is especially so because of the housing market so that created a big crisis for the banks. Do you think that this real estate crisis is going to come to an end, or is it going to be present, unlike in France and Spain? Spain saw an important crisis in the property, but it demolished the number of houses so as not to see a decrease in the price of houses. For the question, I think the situation in Italy is different from France, and I know it less well, so I didn't want to touch it too much. Uh, so it's difficult to, to make predictions on that. Uh, the, what we can be confident is that in the long run, things will return to normal, but of course, uh, in the long run, it will we're be a dead. long time. And uh, we are in a sort of anormal situation in which, for instance, uh, in some countries, the price of housing declines, Spain, you said Italy. In France, it went up, despite the crisis. And if I connect that to the questions before, it's because in the context of the financial crisis, uh, real estate was an asset, a sort of relatively safer assets, and people who have liquidity 
and big liquidity. They didn't want to take risk of bankruptcy, so they bought houses or apartments in big cities, London, Paris, uh, uh, and maybe not uh, in less liquid uh, markets. So uh, that was the paradox where the price of housing, despite the crisis, it went up. It went down a little bit in 2007 in France by 10%, 15%, but then immediately after it went up when the financial crisis started to threaten the banks. So the, the, the financial cycle and the housing cycles are quite correlated, but not in the way I would have expected before. Um, and so to come back on Italy, I think the, uh, the, the, the main issue comes from the fact that too many people own their houses. A good economy is an economy in which people could move from one place to another relatively fast. And this is always the case. It's easier if you rent, if you have a house, you, you love it because it's your family house, but then uh, that region declines, then uh, it's rationally optimal to move uh, and sell it. But if everyone does the same at the same time, then you have to, to face a big capital loss. So that's why, in terms of public policy recommendation, I would say never encourage people to buy, mm. uh, but develop a, a good rental market, which is fluid enough, so that every young people can live and work where they want. I'm finishing a study for France at the moment on mobility of young people. It turns out that uh, it's very difficult for young people to rent because they don't have good jobs. They, don't have, temp uh, they have temporary contracts, but not permanent contracts. So nobody wants to rent to them, and so it's, we have a sort of trap. And uh, again, that's the connection between the economy and the housing market, which uh, become a sort of bottleneck of, of the economy. So, yeah. Um, I have a question about the US market. Before the subprime crisis, you could buy a house, like a 100,000 house, with a 100,000 mortgage, but if the price of the house doubled, you could, so to speak, cash the increasing, going to the bank and saying, okay, my house now, its market price is 200,000, so please give me $50,000 more. So you do not earn only the rent, but also you could cash the price increase. Mm -hmm. So yeah. does it challenge your conclusion, your approach or not? I, I don't know. I think that the, um, there are some precautionary policies that have not been very effective in the US. Indeed, people could buy with, yeah. with no uh, upfront payment, almost. And that's not a good idea because it increased the volatility of the economy. And there is a sort of uh, um, amplification of shocks. When everything goes well, people buy houses at an incredible price. They have no thing they have to pay for the mortgage uh, for a couple of years. But at some point, the economy uh, gets into a depression, a big one like in 2007. And then people have, uh, have still the debt, but they don't have the, the collateral because the, the collateral is the, the house. And that house has, has, uh, has no value anymore. And so you come to these uh, situations of poor people being evicted, foreclosures, and, and so on. So that means that. We, we need to res refrain banks from uh, making too many credits. We need to refrain the state to push for uh, buying, and we need to restrain people, refrain people from buying uh, at any price. And that means public policy intervention, but wise one, uh, thinking that one should uh, protect people against themselves somehow. Mm -hmm. There's, time, there's time for a couple of more questions. One, two, three, that's all. I'm going to ask a question in Italian. Can you go back to something you said earlier on? You said that the real estate is, some, is the house where you live in, so it is not just about an investment. But based on what we, we heard, I believe that uh, the top 1% invest in areas where the price of houses uh, climb up, such as Rome, Paris, London, whereas the houses that have lost value, that didn't see any increase in terms of value, are the ones owned by the um, weakest, by the remaining 90%. So there's no capital gain to be obtained when selling those houses. And 
basically the richer are going to have a greater uh, greater property, more valuable property, and the poorer will see a reduction in the value of their houses. Not as simple as one simple indicator can show the K over Y is just a simplistic indicator. Uh, what I just claim is that it's difficult to interpret it as in terms of self-perpetuating inequality. What you say is that if you own some, if I understood correctly, that if you own, and if, if you're super rich, you can diversify pretty well. If you're poor middle class and you buy a house, then you cannot diversify at all. And so you could be hurt more because you have less diversification. And I fully agree with this. And uh, that, that we are in total agreement there. So. Uh, uh, this only says one thing, which is K over Y is not a very good measure of these uh, disorders, economic disorders that uh, we tend to think about. And that's not the, the best proxy for perpetual wealth accumulation. Last one. It's, it's more or less the same question, actually. So uh, I, I was wondering just in, in one of your graphs, uh, you show that. Uh, the price of houses de increased the, of around 100% in less than a decade, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> and that's a huge capital gain for someone who invested in houses in 2001, for, for example. Uh, <clears throat> in this case, I think Piketty's thesis could be ri uh, right uh, <clears throat> if this return on capital is much more, and it is, uh, much bigger than the growth, isn't it? I mean, yeah. So, what this shows for sure is that there is an intergenerational component of inequality. So, that is, if you are now 55, 60, and you bought 25 years ago, then this trend is very good for you because uh, you bought at a low price and now you are on a pile of money. Uh, no question about that. So, Again, uh, the fact that you don't intend to sell doesn't and means that you have not accumulated a lot of wealth. You bought in the 70s, it had a little value. You, you have it now in, 19, in 2010, it has a bigger value, but you have not become super rich. It's still the same apartment, it's still the same uh, house. Okay? So there has not been this process of snowball, uh, you know, this accumulation of capital. Of course, you're richer, I would say, technically, in the cross-section. So you have older people are richer because of the price of housing than young people that are born 20 years too late. And so they have to face this increase in prices. And at the same time, uh, for that exact reason, the fact, that the, the fact that the price of housing goes down is a good news for young people. Because, uh, so you're going to say, yes, but they will inherit less from their parents. Okay, but at some point, <laughs> uh, there, is, there are gains, there are losses from any change in the economy. Any price changes will lead to uh, distributional effects. We are in full agreement with that. The question is the interpretation one can make out of it. And again, I don't mean that we should not worry at all about inequality. There are inequalities and there are transfers between generations which are probably extreme in that period. But we should not worry about the fact that the economy is going to be possessed by a few because this doesn't tell us that story. It tells a different story, that an increase in the price of housing is good for my parents. It's good for me because I'm getting older. It's not good for young people. And when it will go down, that will be the opposite. So there are always distributional consequences of any trend. Um, but it's not a process that, are, that is out of control. Okay? It's, again, I take the same analogy as in the beginning. The economy is something producing energy plus some kind of uh, you know, side effects uh, that have bad consequences sometimes. But that process is not out of control. I don't think so. Bene, con questa conclusione quasi rassicurante. Well, with these reassuring words, I think we can close the meeting. So the real estate market is not pointing to a huge problem. If we look, for example, of the salaries of the top 1%, then we certainly see a huge problem. 
So if you're interested in such a subject, if you're not interested in going through all the um, papers in this website, website, in the website that he um, presented, there's a summary of what was said. La Voce dot info present also a summary of the report of the works by Etienne and Thomas. So if you're interested, please go back to that. So I'd like to thank Etienne Basmer. and would like to thank you all for this interesting Q&A session. Everything, not everything is fine, as the gentleman says, but at least we've understood something more as to look at what is not going that well. Thank you.